I got, he's given me such a big build up. Everywhere I go, I hear my name called. Ken, Ken. Uh, um, thank you, Sarah, because you, you touched on some of the areas that I hope to touch on in this lecture. Obviously, even if you have somebody named Moses, is this, this is a Jewish picture. What is it made for, and where does it come from? Now, it seems to me with a subject that people know little about, as most people would say, you, you make it very simple. You tell them a simple story, simple facts. Nobody's going to remember anything anyway, right? So why, why make it difficult? Uh, I grew up in uh, New York City, and the rabbi was somebody named David Gordis, who befriended me. I was the kid who never went to Hebrew school. I still can't speak a word of Hebrew. But the rabbi, everybody's afraid of, befriended me. And he wrote a book called Koheleth. And he used to say something, I was reminded of it earlier this week at Yad Vashem, that I hadn't heard in a long time, about the more knowledge you have, the more pain you have. That if you know nothing and you have an opinion, everything is very simple, you feel good, that's it. You don't have to think. Of course, you don't really understand anything, you don't know anything. But if you have to think, and you know less because you know more, then you're in trouble. So in order to do this, and make it at least a little bit interesting for people, we're going to make this into a mystery. I'm going to show you two paintings from my collection that were in the 17th century that I insist have some bizarre connection with Judaism, that even when I tell you what the connection is, you say, what is he talking about? This is sugar in it. In the case of the first painting, I can't prove it, though I think I'm right. In the case of the second painting, I can prove it, which is even more fantastic. So let's get started. I'll show you the first painting. Now this is a painting of a Hindu holy man, a tree. He's got a peaceful king of animals. The predators are not killing the prey. It's got two types of birds here. My interpretation of this painting, and I think I'm correct, uh, a great scholar told me where I should look for it, but it's thousands of volumes. And I've never been able to find it. And she died before she could give me the citation. That's 30 years and nobody else knows. There was a holy man who got angry at the gods, and so he decided in his mind he would create an alternate universe. So everything in this picture is his alternate universe. Everything is gold. And there are texts saying that he grew the animals and human heads, the humans, for his alternate universe on this tree. Okay. Does it, what does this have to do with Jews? I insist it has something to do with Jews and King Solomon. And also a number of other people there, Alexander the Great, maybe Shiva, maybe the search for God. So even when I tell you I have the answer, I'm telling you it's a partial answer, and it refers to all of these things simultaneously. And maybe a few things I haven't described. The second one is an even more extraordinary painting. I bought it quite simply because it's a painting of a Sufi. Uh, it comes from a Muslim court. Uh, 1650 or so, and in this court they were very eclectic in their thinking. The Sultan called himself a guru to the world. He wrote poetry and music uh, in the name of a uh, Hindu goddess, but it's a Sufi. We know it from the costume that he's wearing. If you saw a guy Lubavitcher, you know, you know, you know who he was. So you read the inscription and you find out the inscription is Matyenda Nath, one of the founders of Hatha Yoga. How can this be? So, what am I going to try to tell you? I'm going to tell you it's also a picture of Jonah. Okay? So we're going to go through this thing, and I'm going to give you cues, I'm going to go up all around the world. And the first cue is this, that according to a famous Muslim writer from, uh, in Persia, that Jonah belonged to the group of Sufis that God retrieved from the belly of the fish of destruction and placed in the water of separation, meaning everyday existence separate from God. And they came to bring humanity towards salvation. Now, why am I going to take you on such a long route? You remember the guy who never got another job after he was the travel agent for Moses? Forty years, the guy wound up in the desert, didn't reach the promised land. I don't, I've been traveling more than 40 years. My specialty is Maharajas. I'm here talking about Jews and other things like that. How did I get to this place? 
because every place I go, I find something else and I try to connect things that are not in a single discourse. So this is my thing. Now, first of all, if we were looking for pictures of Jews in India, I'm going to show you some pictures of Jews in India. And I'm going to first show you pictures of Jews in Kerala in the south of India. Near Cochin would be a place that didn't exist until 1341. These are early 16th century pictures done by the Portuguese. We've got your Christian, we've got your Hindu, and we've got your Muslim, and we've got your Jew. We know this from the inscriptions, and they were made to show you what the people looked like. Well, the one with the cross, that ain't no Muslim. Okay. I'll give you the hint. The one over here, that's the Jew. Okay. You couldn't figure out by looking at them. The next one is an 18th century painting uh, that was done to a text written by a governor of the Mughal uh, emperors. And uh, he wrote all this poetry that had to do with the wars of Mohammed. So this is a picture of Mohammed and Ali represented by the flames. And they're attacking a Jewish fortress. Well, this you can figure out what it is, not by how the people look, but by the text that tells you exactly what it is. This one is even more impossible. Now, you see in the center, uh, right here, this is the uh, phallic uh, symbol of, of Shiva. It's a Shiva temple, a famous Shiva temple, that is a symbol of temple destruction by the Muslims. And it's a, temple, it's a painting done in Bukhara. Now, according to the, the text of the uh, entry in the British Library, the poet who wrote this is shown in this temple with Zoroastrians, Muslims, Jews, and Hindus. Now, I haven't been back to the person who wrote that thing, but I can't figure out which one is the Jew. Maybe somebody could help me by the costume or something. Now, this one is a lot easier. Showing you a picture of a Jew, right? It's a Jew. No, not a Jew. He's a guy from Turkestan. We know that from the inscription. It tells you he's not Jewish. I say this for a particular reason, because you hear very often that, that people see somebody in India and they'll say, he looks Jewish. So you have to be careful with these sort of things. Since I don't have the time to read Koheleth, I read comic strips instead. <laughs> and this comic strip says, the guy says, I don't like to have informed opinions. It takes too much work to get informed. The whole point of having an opinion is it makes you feel good. The other guy says, that's nuts. It's not nuts. Unless you have hard data to back up that opinion, it was nothing but an uninformed opinion that felt good. It's very hard to deal with something because people want to come around with something particular. You have students. You don't want them to be confused. But you also want them to be able to think so that they don't make these kind of decisions. Now, every piece that we see, if we see a piece of art, we very often see it in a decontextualized way. These are two brilliant sculptures from India of the god Shiva. In fact, the one on this side, the standing figure, is my favorite work. When this came to an exhibit at the National Gallery many years ago, I wrote, I wrote for Arts of Asia a review of this exhibit, I spent all of my time looking at this thing. I, I, I don't have the patience to look at something for two minutes. I spent all of my time thinking. I've been twice to the museum in the palace in Tanjore, where this thing is. Each time I've taken a folding chair, went, sat down in front of the statue, and didn't move. Didn't look at anything else. They got absolutely great stuff. It's such a brilliant piece of work. We display these pictures in America. The people who buy these pictures are the wealthiest of the wealthiest, mega millionaires. And they always have a little Chinese painting behind it. And maybe they have a Picasso. And they know nothing about it. You say, well, who is that a picture of? Uh, some Indian guy. You know? Yeah, you have to have a Ming vase and a Chola bronze and so on and so forth. You don't have to understand it. Well, let's look how they would have seen this. This is closer to how you would have seen these displayed in a temple. Clothed. And many times when you go into temples, you don't see the image at all. It's totally covered in flowers. Sometimes the images are taken out and carried, uh, but that's uh, for a particular festival. So obviously, one of the questions, if you read images, should be in terms of your own personal views. After all, you don't owe anybody if you like Picasso a certain way, so you like Picasso a certain way. If you want to interpret it this way, that's your privilege. Should you consider what the impression is of the patron? 
Should you consider the oppression of the artist? Should you consider the oppression of your friends? How should you look at things? What I'm trying to do is gather all the different diverse elements that make up a picture. First of all, it's cultural and religious spaces. But beyond that, the aesthetic sensibilities. Because sometimes things are in there for aesthetic reasons. And when you try to do that, everything becomes much more fragmented and confusing. Let me give you an example. For my exhibit on Jews in India, uh, one of the paintings I'm considering is this painting of Joseph. He's in the water. You can't tell that he's a Jew. In fact, the only one you're really able to identify as an Indian is the African. Because the person who made this painting, and I know for the turban, I know exactly where that African was in India, by the turban. So he's drawing it from, in a way that would help you recognize where that person came from. The other people are drawn in a generic way, except for Joseph, who is noted by his flame, as you, Professor, as, as you so clearly showed. Now, as you said in your picture, people change things, so it's in their frame of rec reference. It becomes decontextualized. It doesn't matter whether it originally came from the Hebrew Bible. It becomes something new and different, and everybody sees something different. And Indians and people in, in the subcontinent in general, Pakistanis and others, aren't any different than anybody else. They decontextualize it and they put things in their own way. There is a place called the Throne of Solomon. It's in Kashmir. And many Muslims will tell you this is where Solomon was. He wasn't in the Middle East, like you said, because you know there was never any temple there. As, uh, as one uh, Muslim prince told me, uh, there never was a temple in Jerusalem. I said, your, your, your prophet Solomon wrote it, but luckily he wasn't one of the guys who believed that Solomon ruled in Kashmir. There is a place called Adam's Peak in Sri Lanka, where many um, Indians in the past believed that Adam descended. Uh, and so this was the place, the first revelation, the first mosque, the first caliphate, and so on and so forth. That's obviously not generally accepted. But there are people who, who believe in this tradition, and even today. So things may not be as they look or mean the same thing to you as to somebody else. The next thing we have is if you take the religion of the artist, you sometimes say, OK, this is a Hindu painting or a Muslim painting. These are self-portraits by a Muslim and a Hindu artist who work for the same Muslim emperor, and they picked up on Persian sauces, which are not only, Persian is not the same as Islamic. It's interesting to me, when we talk about uh, people who came from Europe, we say they were British, they were French. When we talk about people who came from the Islamic world, we say they were Muslims. We don't say they're Egyptians, we don't say they're Persians, they're, as if they're all Muslims. And the fact that they're Muslims does not mean that they're all the same. Take this painting. This is a painting done for a Hindu ruler. It's a Hindu subject. It's a Hindu deities. It's made by a Muslim artist. So I assume he did not do this for religious reasons. He did it because his patron told him to do it. But if he drew a Muslim subject, you'd assume he was doing it for, for religious reasons rather than because that's what somebody wanted him to do. Of course, it, there can be Islamic fo focuses. And you have to consider that certain things are in the Quran, certain things come from Sufis, but very often they add ideas or change details to fit in with uh, Islamic observance. They're interested in the miraculous deeds of the prophets, and the motif of light generally occurs as a symbol of prophethood. In addition to which, one also has to consider that, um, oops, sorry, went the wrong way, is that very often paintings are used as ways of illustrating non-historical, acronistic narratives. The way the Quran is particularly written is to illustrate this. And in these paintings, very often you'll see things, characters from the Hebrew Bible, Greek mythology, and so on and so forth. I'll show you an equivalence between Plato and David that I bet you've never seen before. But nevertheless, they are the same in this sense. It's not the particular events that are important, but the nature of their connection to a particular idea. In addition to which, when you come into the Sufi tradition, you have another sort of thing where you're trying to 
explain the principle of the oneness of God for the oneness of being. And they talk about one of the great Sufi writers, El Arabi, having a vision in which he met all the prophets at the same time, and they all preached the same thing. So the first clue to our mysteries is you have to focus on similar qualities, that you can have two different people, and if they have a similar quality, they may be interchangeable in some way. For example, one of the great Sufis in India identified the yogis with the prophets rec recognized in the Quran. And this is a clue to what we're talking about with our great mystery. So let's talk about how confused this is if you, if you just read what is the simplistic way of looking at this. You can't understand these paintings. This is the prophet Elijah. Elias saving somebody. And he's associated with water. Here. He's also associated with or equated with a, another Muslim prophet, this gentleman, Kizer. And Kizer supposedly gave Elijah the, the elixir of immortality. So what is the connection here? I'm going to come back to this when we, that mysterious painting. It's all connected together, and you're supposed to read it as all connected together, even though these things are totally, seem to have nothing at all to do with each other. The prophet Elijah, according to the Quran, told the people to worship Allah, not Baal. Like John the Baptist, he was a preacher of truth, not a man of action. He was also a mysterious guardian figure, and he also was a, an exponent of mysticism. So he represents in Sufi thought the inner light of mysticism, which is parallel to and contrasted with the apostolic, legalistic aspects of prophecy signified by Moses. I'll say that again because you, we think of, we tend to equate Islam with the law, but there's also this mystical tradition and the question of love and so on and so forth that are part of this. And if you consider the Muslim tradition as a whole, it's love and law. Well, I'm talking about Islamic sources. I would, I'm in Bar Ilan University, so I have to talk about Jews. There was this tradition, uh, mainly in Persia and the Arab world, of these non-biblical midrashes, midrashim, uh, with information, interpretations about people in the Bible. Now, the lives of the fi biblical fi figures are not really fleshed out for the most part in the Quran, so you can add to it, because you're not contradicting anything. And they, there are these books, by, like one by Nishapuri, which are largely drawn on Jewish sites. So the next question I ask myself, this is well known, what about Jewish Sufis, and what about Jews? Did they play any influence in these paintings? And in fact, there are two important Jewish Sufis. This is one, you can see me at the shrine here. This is a fellow who died in India in 1435, who was born a Jew in Aleppo. And this is a painting of him in a popular thing, riding a tiger. And this is a shrine of his order, where uh, there was both Hindus and Muslims worshiping, and uh, officiants of both groups. And you can see me at the shrine itself in India a few years ago. Um, and so for my exhibit, I'm hoping that they will be courteous enough to lend me the artifacts of the saint. This is 15th century. I can't find any literary tradition from that time that would play any evidence to this. The second Sufi was a Armenian Jew who came to India and became a, uh, one of the teachers as a Sufi of the son of the guy who built the Taj Mahal who was the oldest son and is scheduled to be the heir apparent, and he lost out to his third brother, who's shown in the book on the left-hand side, who killed him. And of course, according to the tradition, the, at, when he died, the body picked up the head and ran up the sta stairs saying, I am God, I am God. And you can visit his tomb in the great mosque in the old city of Delhi. And there's a painting of him, there are several paintings of him. Did he play any role in transmitting any stories? We have his poems, which are very lovely and have been translated into English. And he was involved in a, a book about the comparison of religions and sects written about 1655. But most of the images that I'm showing you had prototypes before that time. So that's not where it comes from. Well, what about 
strictly Jewish sources. Are there any strictly Jewish sources of this? There's one enigmatic thing. This is a Megillah that was sold at Sotheby's recently. And I've never been able to get pictures from them or find out where it is. And these are the only pictures I have. I can barely see whether it's even a legitimate thing. But if you can see in the upper text, you can see the Devnagri Indian writing as well. And I really can't even make out what the pictures are, but these are the supposedly the illustrations according to the catalog. Can't think that this looks too late anyway. It doesn't have any relationship to it. Would you find pictures of Jews? I mean, after all, you know, you can find a picture of anything. You know, if I wanted to find something about, uh, I don't know, about Botswana, I'm sure I could find something about Botswana and Israel. It doesn't mean it's typical. But if you look, you'll find a lot of these paintings. For example, this is a painting of Mordechai at the feet of Ahasuerus, 17th century. And we know it comes from a volume that was owned by the Mughal emperor uh, that he got from a Jesuit. So a lot of these things came from Christians. There were a lot of Christian priests that came, and they hoped to convert the emperor. And I'll show you how, I'll show you how he misread them. Things that he wanted to do, and he took their imagery and used it to, uh, to support his dynasty, but they took, thought he was on the verge of converting to Christianity. These Christian sources led to a lot of technological differences, and you can see a tremendous difference between the paintings of the Mughals and the, the Persians. Uh, the use of perspective to convey distance, shading to project volume, and exotic European figures came to Mughal artists from biblical prints and the Jesuits. Now this comes clearer when you look at paintings even from a provincial center far away. These are paintings of Isaac and Lot. Not from a Jewish source. Painted by Muslims. Is that clear? I think so. Now these are two paintings that really are basically the same paintings. One is the story on the right-hand side of King Solomon. He's a universal emperor. He brings peace to the world. That's clear-cut. The one on the left from my collection is a painting of Vishnu coming in to save an elephant from being eaten by a crocodile. And he's followed, he comes so fast to make the savior that his mount he leaves behind. Now, if you look at the structure of this painting, and I'll come back to this, you notice the elephant and the crocodile in the water in both paintings. And you notice the big bird in both paintings. So structurally, they're very similar. There's a reason for that. That's not accidental. A big part of the tradition of these paintings has to do with love imagery. You know, in Christianity, you think of St. Teresa of Villa by Bernini. And this effective mysticism, the connection between the human soul and God, represented in terms of female and male. And this is a very big part of the Hindu tradition. It's called the Bhakti tradition. And Bhakti and Sufism affected each other. So Muslims and Hindus influenced each other. Where do Jews come into this? Well, of course, one of the symbols of love in Islamic tradition are the use of both Joseph and Solomon in Sufi works, as you can see in both of these cases. There's a third figure, and I'm going to introduce this just to confuse you, but I'm telling you it's part of the clue for the painting that I can't figure out about, so I have to tell you. This is a painting from the Persian tradition, not necessarily the Muslim tradition, of this guy who loves this woman. You can see him on the left-hand side so much that he wastes away to nothing. But because he has such great love, the animals are at peace, the world is at peace because of his love, but he's defeated by his love. And these are, the picture on the right-hand side is a picture that's very similar that was done for Hindu ruler and probably done for decorative reasons and not for religious reasons. But you can see the similarities between the two. So I've said to you that not everything that a Muslim does is necessarily religious. Not everything that a Jew does is necessarily religious. But not all these influences are religious. There's also dynastic things. If you're a king and you're making paintings, you're trying to do things that show the legitimacy of your realm. And what the Jesuits interpreted as being Christian 
the things that they wanted the emperor to use, actually would be do, done by the emperor for totally different reasons, to bolster his dynastic claims. These Mughal emperors claimed ancestry from Genghis Khan and Timurlane. Two people outside of India, they were known as the Mughals. The name came from, comes from Mongol, M-O-N-G-O-L. And this is important because their ancestor was supposed to be a virgin queen. They also had, from the Mongol tradition, religious disputes. The, the third emperor, the great emperor Akbar, as you can see from this thing, you see Catholic priests in these disputes. And um, there were even Jews in these disputes from what we know. Now these were different than the things if you talk about Nachmanides and so on and so forth in Europe, where the Jew always lost. In basketball in America, we have the Harlem Globetrotters. They always win every game. Well, the Christians always won these religious disputes in Europe. This emperor was used to having everybody argue. He had people from every religion, every shade of thought, arguing together and listening to them all. He was also interested in helping to create a situation where Hindus did not have to convert and become Muslims. And he did this by taking Hindu epics and putting them into, translating them to Persian as books. So they became, quote, people of the book, like the Christians and the Jews. Anybody tired? I am. Uh, and the major thing here is, are there any paintings? So let's start quickly going through the paintings. There are two books to look at. Mogul themes, uh, excuse me, but biblical themes in Mogul paintings. And there are only a few pictures of Joseph telling Jacob about his dream. 147 illustrations, and those are in there mainly because they show us technical things, and they're not in there to show any religious sort of thing. So that suggests that it's very rare. And in this well-known book from Israel, only four of the 50 images come from India, and one of them depicts Jesus, so I guess that's not Jewish. So I decide to do this very differently. Um, if I pick up the catalog of a, an important Muslim library, the, the Library of the Nawab of Rampur, which lists all the illustrated manuscripts that he has, am I going to find pictures like this? You know, just take this off my shelf, take it up, and I'll look at everything, and okay. So this is what I find. The first volume that I come into is a set of poems from an Afghan prince who's coming to India. And the first thing is fair, well, this actually shows something else, but the, the picture, but there are other illustrations of Pharaoh as a devotee of Shiva. There's Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Solomon, Moses, and the Queen of Sheba, and so on and so forth. And you notice Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, folio 418, are shown alongside these other legendary lovers. Do you remember the guy who was so thin. And I found all sorts of manuscripts like this. This is just one of many examples. I also found images of the Moses and Joshua fish. No, really. I mean, you have to have a Moses and Joshua fish. And apparently, it's some sort of flat founder that's fed. I never heard of this. Did anybody heard of this? But I looked it up in the Wikipedia. That's what they say, so it must be true. But it's there in India. Okay, so let me start showing you some of these pictures. There are 28 prophets in the Quran, and there are many other unnamed prophets. And the most common Indian images are of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, because this is the image of love. Also, Solomon as the, as the lover of the Queen of Sheba, she's known as Bilkis, and Solomon as a universal emperor. So without trying too hard, I made up uh, a list from the internet of all these different prophets most of whom are in the Hebrew Bible. I found most of them. They're easy to find. If you just look in common sources. The first, there are many images of Adam, and they stress something that's slightly different. That, Adam, that Satan's great sin is he refuses Allah's command to bow down to Adam. He then seduces not only Adam and Eve, he seduces this serpent and the peacock, representing human carnal desire, in order to do this. And very often, Adam and Eve ride out of paradise on, the, uh, on these animals. 
another image that I found, the angels are escorting Adam out. So this is clearly to tell a particular story. But what about this image of Adam? Copied from a Christian book. And obviously it's done as a study of European techniques. But the idea of this sort of brooding figure or a barely uh, clothed or naked figure with a dog is very often used later to represent Sufis. And this is where it probably comes from. You also found a number of illustrations of this giant who was supposedly the son of, uh, of Cain, the product of, fa of brother, sister, incest. And he's the arch fiend who tries to thwart God's will generation after generation. He plots with the Pharaoh against the Israelites, and so on. Now, this, in this painting, he has a huge rock, and he's going to flatten the Israelis. But God sends a bird to pick a hole in the rock, and the rock falls around his neck. And I'm going to show you another picture of him, where he touches a stick to this much where Moses touches a stick to this much larger figure and kills him. To show the power of monotheistic things. I also found the prophet Enoch who was sometimes, Idras, who was sometimes identified with the prophet Enoch. And he introduced writing, weaving, mathematics, and astronomy to the world. And here he is supervising various stages of weaving. One of the greatest of all Indian paintings by a Mughal artist of Noah and the Ark. Just, I, this is an amazing painting. There are, of course, many paintings of Khalil Allah, the friend of God, a Abraham, Abraham and his sacrifice of Ishmael. But another common theme that you don't see in the Jewish literature is this one, Abraham entertaining a Zoroastrian. This comes from a Persian text, 13th century Persian text. The painting is later in India. Here's another such thing, and the text basically says that he feels defiled by being with this Zoroastrian, and he's told that, you know, if, if, if the Zoroastrian is good enough for God, it should be good enough for him. The most common paintings are ones of Joseph. Um, here is, uh, you know, one such painting. Here is Joseph tending sheep. And here's a partial list of the various manuscripts I found. There are many more. Probably could write ten times this number if I just was, had more patience. Here is Joseph kidnapped by his brothers. Joseph beaten by his brothers. Joseph taken by the well by, by uh, traveling merchants. Jacob hearing the news of Joseph's absence. Joseph bathing in the Nile. And I think the African here is a nice touch. He's, they're cleaning him up so he'll fetch a higher price at the slave auction. Why is the figure of Joseph so important? First of all, he merits, he's the only one who really merits a whole chapter in the Quran, but he's glorified in all of these Persian texts. And they reimagine the part of the story about jo uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, Zuleika, to represent the mystical quest for absolute trip and, human, uh, and, and union with God. So here's Zuleika dreaming of Joseph. She tries to seduce him sex sexually. Her physical yearning symbolizes the desire of believers to join with the divine. The writer of this great text found in her love of Yosef, a metaphor for the spiritual obsessional love of a Sufi for God, and Joseph's beauty as being a reflection of God's countenance. Now the last sentence here I think is the most important. It's not a throwaway. Because over and over you hear the idea that female charms have thrown many a Yosef in the well. The idea thing that men are somehow unable to fulfill their highest things because of the seduction of women. Do they have that in Judaism too? No? I don't know. Okay. Anyway, Zuleika has dreams about Joseph. She sees him at the auction. She's so obsessed with him that she has the walls of her chamber embellished with paintings of lovers embracing, surrounding herself visually with what she can't have. Physically, she tells all her friends, they say, oh my God, this guy, we're all hot for this guy. 
Finally, she becomes an old lady and she meets him again and she's really old, but she's transferred and becomes young again when she realizes it's not Joseph that she wants, it's, it's that spiritual quest that she wants. And that's the message here. To just stick in an artist by a contemporary uh, Indian Jewish artist, this is uh, her, it's really a self-portrait of herself, but it's supposed to be Joseph's coat. There are other images of Joseph which are used because one can use the techniques from it. So what the Muslims did, the Mughals, they took these proselytizing images and they became art innovations. So yes, it's a painting of Joseph, but it doesn't have to do with any Sufis. It has to do with the studies that you would make that would improve your techniques and develop new ways of depicting things. And artists in India were always looking for new ways of doing this, as can be seen from these 18th century paintings of Moses and Ari. Now, you saw a picture of Mo Moses. Sorry, you just showed us a wonderful picture. And uh, it, it showed him getting the law. This was not the thing that were emphasized in paintings of Moses. The painting in the paintings of Moses, of course, didn't deal mainly with the deliverance of the Jewish people from bondage, but they stressed that Moses was powerful because he was a monotheist. This gives you, if you are a monotheist and you believe in Allah, you will have power to overcome great odds. Even in this painting of the drowning of Pharaoh and so on and so forth, the emphasis is upon, if you see in the upper part of the painting, on worshiping God, not on deliverance or anything else. The same thing comes up in this other painting where Moses takes a step to Oak and f kills him, even though he's much smaller. And lastly, there are things to illustrate other text. This text illustrates an important story. Guy is very poor, comes to Moses and say, Moses, I want a boon. You know, people go to holy men, they go to the Babasali, and they go to things and they ask for boons. Yes. And that's why you would go to Moses. And next thing, time Moses sees him, he's being led up to be executed because he got drunk and killed somebody. And the motto given is, ant is best when it has not wings. You know, accept your station in life, don't go beyond it, don't be uh, a megalomaniac, don't be narcissistic, and so on and so forth. <laughs> in the Sufi tradition, many, many Sufis regard David as the originator of many of their practices. And so we start to see text related to David and Solomon. In this picture of King David, I, my guess is it was picked for, its aesthetic, for aesthetic reasons rather than for its content. But I don't think it's true of this next one. Because although the Islamic David was influenced and inspired by the biblical David, many connections were made in uh, to the mythical Orphic figure, and here he is uh, in Orphic figure, and um, the Quran refers to mountains and birds joining David in his praise of God and the power of instruments over wild beasts. Now this is obviously not a specifically Jewish thought for Muslims, for some Muslims. It's the same thought. You can put anybody else in here, and here's a picture of Plato doing the same thing totally in an ahistorical way. So according to this kind of painting, or these kind of paintings, that the representation of Plato and David can be seen as Orphic figures. And there are other examples of such borrowing. So you can transfer things from one thing to another. And that's the important thing. Now this creates an important problem with interpretation. Because if you could transfer things from one thing, I could say anything. I could tell you anything. You know, why not? And we do have a lot of people who do that, or fill in things from one thing to the other. Can you do this? Uh, I myself, as a psychiatrist, have, have always cringed when I hear people thinking, say, well, this is a legend from Ireland, and Ireland somehow has something to do with India, and you can take this Irish myth, and you can put the two to the same, and you can fill in one for the other. 
And I, I you know, and they say it's the collective unconscious. I, I, I think that that's, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. So it has to be textually based. And if you have a thing and you hold to it, you realize it's your own idea and not somebody else's. As you see, I'm trying to distinguish between what I feel it is and what I know and have proven it is. But it becomes very difficult because you see all sorts of things. You see that these kings equated themselves with Solomon. So how does a dynasty where there's a king and his claim to legitimacy is that he, his ancestors, or actually the first king, was really the prime minister of the emperor. So that's his claim to legitimacy. And he never declares independence, but he's very powerful. And he's basically an independent ruler. He says that he is, he calls it the Asif Jah dynasty, and he's equal to the Grand Vizier Asif in the court of King Solomon. And that was the highest title that could be awarded to a subject of the Mughal Emperor. So he never declares independence. So what about these pictures of King Solomon? How does this all get mixed up with their claims to dynastic thing, that they are related in some way to King Solomon? In this painting, we see King Solomon attending to heaven. I want to show you another painting. With it. You notice the figures are the same? Both kings are the same. One is a sultan, and one is King Solomon. So they're trying to show the equivalence here of the two. What's interesting to me also is that the guy holding, giving him the keys, is related to one of the perfect emperors from the Shahs of pre-Islamic times. So he's, he's getting a, a Persian legitimacy, and he's identifying himself with Solomon. And I'll show you how you have to be careful to read things. If you look at the little boy in the corner there, I'm looking for Africans. He's not an African. And that was one of the most difficult things when I tried to find Africans. I knew who the Africans were in some cases because I knew who they, who they were. Some of them were lighter than some of the Indians. And this tradition of identifying with gods, you see in the, among Hindus too. This is a Hindu Maharaja who has himself dressed up as Shiva, God Shiva. So one of the things you have is this equation. Solomon is equated not only necessarily with the ruler, but he's also equated with these great emperors of pre-Islamic Persia. And it all gets confused together. In the Mughal Emperor, there was a, a chain of justice, which I'm, I'll show you in a minute. And this chain of, of, uh, of justice was associated with King David, King Solomon, and mythical Iranian kings. So anybody could come, and they could plunk on this chain, which is in the upper left-hand corner, and ask for justice. This is an allegorical painting, and this universal emperor, where everything is peaceful in his kingdom, is killing poverty. An almost identical painting is done by him, where he's killing his, uh, one of his greatest enemy, who happens to be an African Muslim. So it's a, almost, it's a very similar type of painting. It shows how these images were used for different sources. They very often compared the Mughal Emperor to Solomon. And I found a painting where it says that the patron, the painting, this, the, the emperor, was a virtual Jacob in his sympathy, a Joseph in his beauty, a John the Baptist in his piety, and a Solomon in command of his dominions. So this image of Solomon enthroned, he's over the spirits, the demons, the angels, the birds, and everything. He's a universal emperor. And prey and predators lie peacefully in front of this universal emperor, symbolizing his just rule and ability to bring harmony and protect the weak. Very simple. And again, I show you these two paintings. And you can see that in the one on the right-hand side, Hindu painting, Vishnu is coming in 
to save the elephant from the crocodile. In Solomon's kingdom, they don't have to do that. They've already made everything peace. And these birds are important too, which I'll describe later. So this idea of peace among animals under the rule of the Messiah or the universal emperor, where does this come from? The images come from the Antwerp Polyglot Bible. And the emperor, the, the, the thing in India they say is that tigers became so tame that they were walking around among the people. That's how just the emperor was. So not only were prey protected from their oppressors, they were sometimes even given power over them. There's a professor from uh, Vienna, a great professor, uh, Ebekak, who talks about this in terms of the imagery of the throne of Solomon in Islamic tradition. I don't have a good picture of that, but the top of the throne is decorated with a golden pigeon that holds a hawk in its claws, which is interpreted in the text as a symbol for the future rule of the king of, of Israel. So in the Messianic times, everything will be peace and harmony. God willing. Here Solomon has control over the fairies and the demons. There's one thing that Solomon doesn't have control over. Yeah, you've got a bunch of demons. You don't know what to do with them. So they, you make them uh, do all these tasks. They fill the desert with water and fill the sea with sand. And they keep on doing this to keep them busy because he can tell them to make them do it. There's one thing he can't control. His feelings for people, especially his feelings for a woman. This is the vulnerability of Solomon. Here he is with the Queen of Sheba. Here he is again with the Queen of Sheba. The same sort of imagery comes in this from the Persian tradition, in this Indian painting. And this guy's wasted away to nothing. He has power over the animals. He has power over the world. But he doesn't have power over his love for this woman, which represents the love of a Sufi for God. Okay. Now here's where I fail to, to prove my case. But I'll go through it again. So this guy is not a skinny guy. Okay, He's fat. Does he have a woman with him? No. So he, he's overcome that sort of thing. In addition to which, we know from other texts that the birds and the trees that are a different color are birds that are sent by another holy man to disrupt his meditations in which he's going to create this alternate universe. So that all fits together with the idea that that's a reference to this idea of his creating an alternate universe. And the idea of King Solomon being such a figure, they're, say, they're saying the person would think of this. They would think of all these different figures and how these images, which have nothing to do with each other, are used in the same uh, way. Now, it looks sort of like a yogi, and maybe it's Shiva, and um, there's an inscription on it that says it's Iswanath, whether that's the name of a yogi or whether that means uh, another way of calling Shiva, I don't really know. And it has something to do with the search for God. And I'm going to come back to that. I hope I've thoroughly lost you and not proven my point. But that's good, because I'm not going to make any claims. OK, so why do I think that this has something to do with the search for salvation? There's a famous book called The Conference of the Birds. And the birds, each representing a different fault, fly to find this great bird called the Submerge. And that was the bird that we saw in the pictures of Solomon. They go for the valleys of yearning. They go for the valleys of love. They go for the valleys of detachment, of unity with God, bewilderment, everything, and so on and so forth. And they find that this bird that they're trying to find, the Submerge, is actually within them. And you create that universe within yourself. So this is what I think it says. Can't prove it. But I like it. So I'll stick with it. Over and over again, the reason I know these things are collected, connected is because not only because of the text, but because every time they seem to show Solomon, not every time, but many times, they'll show this King Solomon, they will show this thin aesthetic. 
So it's, you'll see Solomon and Sheba, and you'll see Lila and Majnun, these two couples. Well, what does this have to do with emperors? The flattering poets identify the emperor and his consort with Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, known as Bilkis. And we actually have this in terms of the Mughal emperor and his wife. And um, he was devastated by her death. She, I can't remember, I think 14 children for him, and she was a perfect wife who didn't aspire to political power like her father's uh, sec second wife, not second wife, but his chief wife in later years. And one of the emperor's wife, poets wrote, when the lady of this world, the Bilkis, the queen of Sheba of the age, went to paradise, went from the assembly of Solomon, the emperor, to paradise. So she went from being queen of Sheba to Solomon to paradise. Now, why would this be an important image for Mughal emperors in terms of their dynastic thing? Nothing to do with religion. Well, so maybe something in it. One of the things they did is they married the daughters of Hindu Maharajas. Now, in some cases, they were allowed to keep their religion. In other cases, it may be more problematical. But think of what, in Islamic terms, that Solomon does to the Queen of Sheba. He converts her to Islam, to monotheism. So they would have a personal reason to emphasize these stories. Now, here's an example of one of these Hindu wives, and she's known as Miriam, Mary. Well, why does he give her that? That's not her name. That's her title. Why does he give her this name? Because he claims ancestry through Genghis Khan and Timur to a virgin queen. That's his claim to legitimacy. And so we find these paintings... And he gives his mother the title of Mary, too. And this is a picture of birth of uh, the, he's not birth, of this mystical virgin queen who came pregnant by light in the same way as the Virgin Mary and had light conceive uh, triplets. And in the text, it says that from the time of all these emperors, the light, the divine light, came into them in this way through these virgin births. So he's, he's looking at it and saying, saying, in effect, that his mother was a virgin like the Virgin Mary, his wife was like the Virgin Mary, if they have children, and so on and so forth. Now, you can imagine how confused the Jesuits were by this. They come, they bring in these books, they got pictures of Mary and Jesus. This guy puts up pictures of Mary and Jesus. You can see them in his paintings in the back room right over his throne. You can see the Christian paintings. Well, they know that he's going to convert. He has no intention of converting. Yeah, he's interested in virgin queens. Yeah, he's interested in religious uh, discussions. There's one tradition that says that one of the Jesuit priests said, let's throw a Quran in the Bible and into the flame and see which survives. I don't think that I don't think it happened, and I can't imagine it happening in an Islamic country today. Thank God. But the Jesuits' imagery was used as a form of Mughal propaganda, and they also got this second images of the lion and the lamb lying down together. And one scholar has called this the Christian conquest of Catholic art, using it for your own purposes, using the techniques, using the imagery and getting a visual manifestation of your own ideology. And they constantly took whatever they got and they converted it into their uses. They were not copyists. So let's get an example of how they use this and how we, things are transformed for religious reasons or dynastic reasons or for decorative reasons. Uh, this is a picture of the, of the angel Raphael with Tobias. You can see the changes that are made. Does Tobias have wings? And does the female figure have the instrument? This is done for particular reasons. So we need to look and see what those reasons are. It's used to illustrate Sufi parallels and it comes in. So the figure of the woman with the musical instrument, which originates in, uh, in some of the traditions from here, even though there's some paintings earlier that show her, 
and the idea of the man with the dog is used in this way. The, the figure on the left-hand side is a Sufi, and usually traveling with his dog, and you see the female figure. So they put the two together, and they made a marriage. I stated it wrong because I think that this painting antedates the painting that I showed you. So how do we summarize this? Now that you're totally, thoroughly confused, and maybe some of you are with me, Deborah Hutton, who has looked at certain types of paintings, has said, there's a purpose to this. There are multiple layers of meaning. There are many ways in which an image can be read based on quotes. This multi-layered effects functions as poetic metaphors and suggests the inner hidden essence or truth of Sufism. But it's not just an accident or they threw things together. It has a purpose. It has a meaning. I might misread it because I have my own agenda that I bring to it, but it does have a reason. So even though if you have this skinny guy and King Solomon, they share an attribute, and it links the two. And a few selective figures can make the copy comparable to the prototype, even though they could be different in many other ways. And such references may be multiple, convoluted, not specifically stated, draw on different narrative or religious sources. And I don't have the images to show you, but this great scholar from Austria has shown how certain niches in the great fort in Delhi imitate the throne of Solomon. And she has all the text and all, it's really quite convincing. So we come back to my painting. Now I'm going to attempt, and I'd like to take a vote, and I want an honest vote. And actually, I want two votes. The first vote is, do you think that I proved my point, or didn't I prove my point? Okay, we're going back to this painting. Everybody ready to be thoroughly confused? Okay, this is a painting, mid-17th century. It's a holy man. It's supposed to be a Muslim holy man. It's inscribed, Matsyendar Nath, the the legendary founder of Hatha Yoga. Does it refer to Jonah? Maybe I should take a third vote. Let's first, how many people think I've convinced you so far? You? You're, you're a good believer. Thank you, I like you. I don't think I've made a case at all. So, okay. So I ran this Sufi conference, and one of the people who came was a great American scholar on Sufism, and he found the text. That thing. It came from a great Sufi master from the Shatari tradition. He tutored the Mughal emperor and the greatest Indian musician. And he has assimilated elements of the yogic tradition to Islamic categories. Here's his tomb in India. OK, so what does he say? He says that he's identified primordial yogis with prophets recognized in Islam. Their leader is Gorak. Gorak is a, a yoga. And some say that he's an expression of Kazir. This was the green fellow here, the Sufi saint. And here, the archetypical yogi has been assimilated to the, the immortal prophet of Islam, who plays an important initiatory role in Sufism. So here's a yogi. They initiate people. This is a Sufi who initiates people. told you that the name of the thing in my painting is Machyendra Nath, and he's a yogi, and this is the shrine that I told you about. And a right-wing Hindu group, the Shiv Sena, claims that it's not a tomb of a Sufi saint, but it's actually the, the site of the death of the aesthetic. So he's saying, in effect, that th these uh, Hindus are saying, in effect, the Muslims took over our shrine, this was originally a shrine of this primordial yogi. Okay, so there's something there, but who knows what it is. According to the poet Jami, a great Persian poet, the source of many of these illustrations, Jonah belonged to a group of Sufis who got a retreat from the belly of the fish of destruction, placed in the waters of separation from God, everyday existence, so they could bring humanity towards salvation. It has something to do with fish. So what does my painting have to do with fish? The painting had no water. It looks like a Sufi. Supposedly it's a yogi. I haven't had any water in this at all. No guesses? I couldn't guess anything either. 
It turns out that this yogi is the namesake for the fish form of Vishnu. Fish form of Vishnu. Now we're getting a little closer. You see this picture of Vishnu in a fish. The next thing you see, another painting from my collection, is Vishnu. This is the fish form of Vishnu, but it's Vishnu coming out of a fish. Well, you can find a rare thing anywhere. Here he is again. Coming out of the fish. In some cases, he's just a fish. This is the story of the flood. We had uh, s somebody here whose husband is an Assyrian scholar, talking about uh, the myth of Gilgamesh. But here he is as a fish. Yeah, Muslims took this over too. Again, coming out of a fish. Okay. But I still haven't proven it, right? Okay. In the text, it says there are two further identifications in this case. That religious leader, the, the yogi, is the same as Elijah or Ilyas. That's the one on the left hand side. Then there's my figure, Matsyanda Nath. And the third, the breath of the fish, which is the religious leader, Matsyanda Nath, is Jonah. Each one of them has attained the water of life. So it says in the text quite clearly that this Sufi yogi, whatever you want to call it, is the same as the Prophet Jonah. You should treat them the same way by this process of partially copying things. If there's some characteristic that's similar, you can equate the two. Okay, how many people think I proved my case? Nobody? Okay. It's, it's convoluted, but I think the evidence is, is clear. Because you have the text, you have the imagery, and so on and so forth. So the next step that would clinch it is if I could show that a Sufis from this particular order, disciples of the man who wrote this text, actually were in that court. Since it was, we know who, pretty much who it was made for. Who were the Sufis who were in that court? I get very happy because I find the names of who the Sufis were. So now I'm going to say, be able to find you a text that says the Sufi was there, he spoke to the king, and the king liked this. This is what I'm looking for. It's India. It never makes any sense. I'm not anywhere near the promised land. The text, says, the text that I read, the secondary text, says exactly the opposite. Even though his guru, uh, not his guru, but his, his, the, the Sufi that he followed, believe this thing about yogis and, 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 and Muslim saints being the same, the saint that actually came there was a very orthodox man, and he tried to convince them not to make these equations. And he was very upset that they made these equations. So if any of you believe that I was right, maybe I'm wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you for the most uh, fascinating uh, uh, subject and the representations. Like. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Before I ask my my question, uh, I would like to to, to uh, ask you about the throne of Solomon. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it was very interesting and very really new for us to see how the idea of Solomon uh, was accepted uh, in the uh, East because uh, every king uh, in the West that built something like uh, temple, church, anything, small, large, whatever, uh, prized himself as Solomon, of course. Uh, so. Uh, Besides any other connotations, it was very interesting to me to see how uh, the painters that you uh, showed here uh, constructed uh, the throne of Solomon. In the European tradition, uh, as a rule, the lines are an uh, integral part uh, of this construction. They can the be. School, they can be. The, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, if a king is a Solomon or like Solomon, uh, he must to build 
something, uh, a temple, the temple, his temple. Uh, is uh, uh, any uh, connotation, connotations like like this where uh, in in Indian? He has to build a temple like Solomon. Uh, yes, yes. Solomon built the temple, and uh, any king or even ruler that build a church, anything like temple, yes, new temple, Christian temple, uh, prized himself or other prized him as a new Solomon, as Solomon, Solomon, and so on. So this architectural uh, point of view, uh, uh, where something like this? Uh, yes, I, I, th I, think, I think it's a very good point. Uh, I think that first of all, there are uh, mosques that are built uh, for that reason, uh, you know, that are associated with particular rulers. Um, but I think sometimes you, I, I think that more in the paintings you see this thing about the just ruler, the ruler who is a universal, and I think the reason you, they contrasted on the universal ruler and in painting is because in the Indian tradition, the, uh, that you have this thing, the Indians had a, an ancient custom, which wasn't followed in later uh, things, that if you took a horse and you let it run for a year and you protected the horse, all the territory that the horse went in was your territory and you, were declare, you could declare yourself a universal emperor. So I think that this idea of the universal emperor who brings peace and, uh, and protects the weak is a very important part of the Indian tradition. And I think they concentrate on that more than on the um, structures. Um, you do see specific references to other things in structures. For example, in the tomb of Ibrahim Adil Shah, uh, Sultan, uh, his name is Ibrahim, so you see references to Abraham because of the similarity there. But I think that they concentrated on um, really on uh, very little on uh, you know building the kind of things that that you said. But I think the Solomonic throne imagery is very important. And the Ebekok, K-O-C-H, is the person who wrote absolutely fantastic paper on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Matt? I have some, one comment, two questions. Thank you very much. I felt again back in September that you really opened an entirely new Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and and that's really awesome. um, one question. Um, the lot that you were talking about in terms of divine, why you don't, didn't mention or compare to uh, the Song of Songs, to the lot that is in Biblical Song of Songs, which has maybe similar connotation? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't find any direct uh, things. Believe me, if I had found something that mentioned one of the Psalms, you would have heard about it. I just didn't find it. But I think that it does come in because, I mean, Solomon. So in that way, it but comes in directly. The, love, the, the concept of divine love between you know, people of Israel and God, and in a way, it's somehow an airplane for me. The one, the, the, I think they got a lot of these yeah. stories from, from Jews, you know, in Persia. And of course, the things that came to Persia came to India as well. So, so you're right, I think. The other one, I noticed in an uh, image, um, you call it Chain of Justice. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, there is a, a tiny Sufi saint standing on a fish in the water at the bottom. And I was expecting that you will develop it, that you will bring it further. Oh, my God. The connection in Another half an hour to this lecture and confuse you more? <laughs> No, no, I think it's a very good comment, again. I mean, it's, it tells that you're reading the painting. And it seems to me that if somebody finds, one, a mistake, or two, something I overlooked. It's, not, it's a question. I just thought somehow... I'm going to go back and look at the painting. Justice and the Sufi saint will come together afterwards in this image. But, okay, that's my... In the, next time. And how do I give you credit for the idea? <laughs> can mention it. No. <laughs> Thank you. about the birds and the story of the birds looking for a bird and finding 
especially if it makes sense. And the most dangerous things are the things that make sense that aren't true. You know, that you, 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 have, you know, have a narrative and you can just fit it in. It's just pure association. No, no, but, I, but, 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 this, but this is, what you're talking about is something that is part of the human tradition. To find something in yourself, to look for it elsewhere in, in, in so many different ways. And I, I think it is a very good parallel. And not to mention that symbolists were much into other cultures, including Far East cultures, and learning about different non-European sources that this metal could have used. I'm not claiming that he knew it from the sources that you're talking about, but they were definitely open to different worlds. But are there chains of influence? I mean, you know, it could be, there could be several degrees of separation that somebody may have read this and or read something else and gone for this and goes from one person to another. And so you can't really follow really where it really started and where it came from. And that's really what I'm trying to deal with. You know, trying to read these paintings as they saw them, not as I see them. And knowing that my evidence is fragmentary and that I'm going to put some sort of generalization on something. You have this problem in looking at any painting. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I asked you earlier was, you know, we know that all of uh, Rembrandt's, the Rembrandt was a Jew, and all these paintings by him were Jew because we know that they wore hats and they had beards. That's not true, is it? Uh, I, I just think that the uh, whole question about the uh, external appearance and the national uh, identification is, is very complex because really uh, we not always know who is Jewish and who is not Jew in the, not only portraits, in the uh, paintings of Rembrandt, even in the thematic paintings. And uh, uh, even more, if you uh, see uh, on the portraits of uh, uh, Dutch Protestants uh, of his period, they look just as uh, orthodox Jews uh, from the Sharing <coughs> of today, for example. So uh, it's uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, our uh, dogmas more than, uh, of course, uh, the uh, semantics of dress in different periods, as you showed, it, it is very nice. Uh, and uh, uh, if I may also comment uh, on the, uh, I, I think anyway, maybe the uh, contact between the cultures are much more uh, intrinsic and and and, uh, uh, and uh, unexpected that we think now, because when I uh, looked at your presentation, I thought about uh, Moshe Idel, Professor Moshe Idel, who uh, spoke about the Sufi uh, influence on the Hasidism, on the Baal Shem Tov, uh, all the teaching, and. Uh, uh, in the article that we are going to publish in our Ars Hebraic, uh, the, the nearest volume, we just uh, uh, introduced the picture that you showed about a, a mobile ruler with a globe in his hand, and uh, Professor Eden showed the story of this globe uh, from uh, the very uh, ancient period through the ages and how it came to, to, to different cultures. So, who knows? Uh, one more point, uh, the uh, imagery of the peaceful animals in 
the paradise that came from Jesuits uh, to uh, India. Uh, at the same time, they came to uh, uh, to, the, to, to America, to the Protestants in America, and there we can find almost the same pictures of the uh, peaceful animals in the paradise. Just another style, but uh, I think just the, the lecture uh, that uh, you represent uh, to, to us now show how all the world is interconnected and how the cultures do uh, influence each uh, other. Yeah, I, I just one last word uh, I don't know what you're saying because one of the questions is if you have something going from one culture to another, you don't know if it's a parallel movement or a diffusion. You don't know if it's going to be interpreted. The very first image that I saw of an Indian deity was, um, was in a spiritualist uh, church in New York uh, from people from the Caribbean. And you find the same image. That particular image of that particular Hindu deity is very often used in West Africa and things like the cult of Mami Water. It has a very different context. They recognize it and they give it a different name and it has a totally different <coughs> meaning than the people who made the poster. Thank you so much. <laughs>